You know the size of the brain doesn't predict anything. 56. <laughs> Guillaume used an electroencephalograph or EEG machine to monitor what happens inside Phil's head when he reads a series of sentences, including one using Shakespeare's intriguing use of a godit to mean deified. EEG records brain waves, electrical signals emitted by the brain. Thierry knew that if the brain's confused by the meaning of a word, it reacts by sending out a distinct electrical response 400 milliseconds after reading the word. It's called an N400. If, on the other hand, the brain's thrown by the grammar, it generates a different response after 600 milliseconds, and that's called a P600. These distinct signals are saying, in effect, N400, ignore that, it's nonsense. P600, that's odd, but it means something. Phil and Guillaume tested four different phrases, starting with a simple control sentence that both made sense and used correct grammar. The next two sentences violated either grammar or sense. The big question was how would Phil's brain respond to that odd word godded? What electrical signal would it generate? After analysing data from 20 other subjects as well as Phil, Guillaume revealed his results. So let's take the first one. They thought so well of the hero that they deified him. And in that case, you get neither an N400 nor a P600. So there is no, no sign of grammatical violation or semantic violation. Essentially, this is the brain saying nothing special here, nothing to react to. It's just, you know, yeah. this is life. We it's our baseline, basically. It's where exactly, we start yeah. from. And yeah. then communication, we can look at the It's communication and, honestly, it's dead boring. So we're not interested in that. No. So which one would you like to take I would definitely next? leave the functional shift for the end. Because that will be more exciting the for, the, one, for the viewers. So to keep the suspense, uh, okay. I would rather keep so the So let's go for, they thought so well of the hero that they printed him. It's obviously semantically inappropriate. And what you're getting here is uh, an N400 variation. An so N400 because it yeah. doesn't make sense to say they thought so well of the hero that they printed him. So an N400 is basically the brain showing Oi, this doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And that's the kind of response we would expect, and that's what we got. So this is very nice. So here, <laughs> in this collaboration, is sentence number three. They yeah. thought so well of the hero they that they candled him. him. What we get is both an N400 and a P600. So we can tell that the brain is, is both uh, shocked in terms of the content, the meaning, and also shocked about the form. So the brain behaves quite differently if it's shocked because it's a syntactical error Absolutely. as from if it's shocked because it's a meaning error, two quite separate processes. Completely different part processes. So fourth, last but now no means least, Shakespeare or Shakespeare diluted. They thought so well of the hero that they godded him. What we get is fundamentally P600 effect. There is no violation of meaning. Meaning is perfectly integrated normally. But the grammatical structure, the, the grammatical disruption is produced. So there's a big P600, a big kick on that word. Right. But nonetheless, unlike with candled, there is no N400. The brain says, I can accept this. So essentially what Shakespeare is doing is every so often, just when he thinks the reader might be getting a bit relaxed and think, knows what's coming next, he'll throw in a kind of um, oddball word to get attention going. You couldn't find a word that's more appropriate actually. Is is basically throwing in something that is going to be surprising, generates, you know, uh, activates these responses from the brain that are really genuinely oddball detectors. So Phil, did you get what you expected out of that? I think so. I think that What's clearly established is it's what uh, scientists call a functional shift, a robust phenomenon. That's to say, it works every time, and Shakespeare uses it often enough for us to be able to infer he knows that that is an important instrument. I would say it's like an evolutionary tool. That's to say, it raises levels of attention. It primes the mind for difficulty. And the chances are that it may be that it leads on 
to the mind being ready to take different pathways from the obvious one. It primes. Phil and Guillaume's unique experiment shows that Shakespeare's literary trick literally electrifies the brain. The expressive use of a noun as a verb acts like a neural kick, snapping the brain to attention. Shakespeare also uses a more common trick to rivet attention. He spins a good yarn. French writer Marcel Proust called stories the divine pleasure. It was one so intense that it made him reluctant to lift his eyes from the page. Recent brain studies suggest that made-up stories, far from being mere escapism, may provide the most energetic of all cerebral workouts. For many generations of readers, Wuthering Heights, the tragic tale of Cathy and Heathcliff, has provided that special pleasure. Its author, Emily Bronte, owed everything to her childhood and an insatiable passion for books. Over 150 years ago, Emily's father, Patrick, an Irish clergyman, came here to the remote village of Haworth with his family. He single-handedly brought up his children, a son, Bramwell, and three daughters, Charlotte, Anne, and Emily. They would all inherit their father's zeal for the written word and in turn create some of the masterpieces of English literature. I met Juliet Barker, a leading biographer of the Bronte family, to find out how reading moulded the minds of Patrick's children. It was crucially important to him. I mean, you have to remember he came from a family that was basically illiterate in Ireland, a small tenant farmer family, um, one of many children, and he taught himself to read and write. And he knew the value of an education. At 16, he set up his own school to teach village children. And he was Patrick's own children read everything they could lay their hands on. We now know, of course, that they were building up those reading networks in their brains. Soon, they began to create their own stories. Well, we're sitting in the parlour, and this was the powerhouse of the Bronte family, because this was where the girls, and Bramwell too as a young boy, spent a lot of their time, because this is where they would gather every day to write and to talk. They would walk around the table, arm in arm, tramping round and round, discussing plots, discussing characters, discussing the stories that they were going to write. So it's one of the interesting things Here in the parlour, the neural circuits inside the Bronte sisters' brains conjured up new worlds and characters. They called their imaginary realms Angria and Gondol. Even in adulthood, Gondol meant everything to Emily Bronte and directly inspired her one completed novel, Wuthering Heights. With Emily, she might be doing the housework, she might be baking bread, but she could be thinking about her imaginary characters all the time. So Gondol was crucial to her and she couldn't break away from that. So Wuthering Heights is literally a continuation of Gondol. Particularly the figure of, of Heathcliff, this, this misanthropic, violent character. Kathy. In a burst of creativity, the story of Heathcliff and Cathy poured from Emily's brain onto the page. Yet... And yet... She is not here. She's on the earth. The words of Emily Bronte still possess the power to change minds and even lives. Tom Palmer grew up in the next valley to Haworth. Just a few years ago, he would never have contemplated picking up a book. <laughs> 